Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, doing another video. Kind of doing something a little bit different with this one. I feel like when, when you get an opportunity to talk to somebody like John Chen, who is the national sales director for Grado Labs, you do it. You know, even if you're not a journalist, even if you've never done an interview ever, which is my case, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea, but why not, you know? So anyway, that's what we did. We sat down with John. We talked about a lot of things. Uh, what an interesting dude. I mean, the guy has just been in the industry forever. Uh, wealth of knowledge from um, working with Saul Morantz to being at Grado Labs for 40 years. Just a gem of a guy, super cool, and uh, I had a great time. So hopefully, uh, you know, it, this is just a relaxing conversation between the two of us, and we kind of talk about a, a whole swath of things. So yeah, stick around. I think you'll enjoy it. And also, if... Um, if you are thinking about jumping into the Grado world, whether it be headphones or cartridge, go to our website. We sell Grado products at skylabsaudio.com. We are proud to be a Grado dealer. We have been a Grado dealer for a long time. They're a great company, and this was a great interview. I wanna thank John Chen and everybody at Grado for allowing us to do this. Yeah, hope you enjoy it. Really appreciate it. Thanks. John, it is such a pleasure. I can't thank you enough. Um, I know the community is going to appreciate all this knowledge that you're about to uh, that you're about to give us. Um, you've been at Grado for how long now? I've been with Grado since 1980, and one way or another. How did you end up working at Grado? Uh, well, the the story of my career started out um, after a college. Um, uh, essentially, you know, uh, we've, my family's always been involved with music one way or the other. And my father was a, um, a diehard music lover. So I grew up with electric voice patricians and a home built Williamson push pull amplifier and all kinds of other equipment. Um, and uh, from there, uh, as you know, things had changed in terms of the um, equipment that was available. Um, for most of uh, my formative years, we had a pair of JBL Lancer 66s, a Duel 1019, and a Fisher 500 C at one time and a 500 T at one time. So um, music was always there, albums. Uh, and my dad was a avid recording engineer in many respects. So in the house, we had an Ampex 350-2, uh, an MX-35. Uh, wow. So um, there was some serious equipment around. So um, it, it not... Did, did he have bands coming into the house or just like solo artists? Well, he, to reco he loved recording my mother, who was a classically trained... Um, oh. opera singer, uh, studied at the Shanghai Conservatory uh, and studied with uh, Russians at the time. So there was a great heritage of, you know, uh, opera and Western knowledge at that time uh, prior to the communist takeover who destroyed all of that. Uh, so, um, uh, so did you just wake up in the morning yeah. to your mother singing yeah. operatic yeah. music? Uh, that really? and then of course, it was natural. It, no, it was constant, you know, music in the house at the time, whether it was Broadway shows on the tape recorder or uh, a Chopin, you know, uh, recording by somebody or, you know, um, you know, there's always a piano in the house. So there's always music in the house from that standpoint. And uh, you now the story goes is that, you know, my father was smitten uh, when he saw my mother in concert one time and followed her to the United States. That's the story. <laughs> goes. Wow. Um, it, that's a long story, but uh, yeah. uh, from that standpoint, uh, there was always um, a very strong drive for music in the house. And at uh, when we became uh, old enough, um, myself, I'm the oldest, my brother and two sisters, uh, we all studied music at the Juilliard School. Incredible. What was that like? <laughs> Uh, intense, totally yeah. intense. Um, some of my classmates, and, and that's why I decided that 
when I, you know, at the end of the, uh, what they call the pre-college um, division, when you're, you know, graduating from high school, you have to make a decision whether to continue on in conservatory or go to a, you know, regular, you know, uh, uh, liberal arts school. Uh, I decided to go to a liberal arts school because I just, you know, the, the talent level uh, is just uh, staggering. You know, I went to school, Yo-Yo Ma. Um, Kawa Chung, Itzhak Perlman, uh, you know, I'm people not familiar like, with those. Yeah, they they were you know the the go tos. They, um, they were it. They were it. I mean, at yeah. the levels, uh, one of my uh, compatriots in my piano studio um, placed sixth. I forget what year at the Van Cliburn. So it was very very high level, and you know, t even today, a, a number of these are, are very high level musicians and. Um, as I said, it's just totally intense, and um, we sort of carried on that tradition from the standpoint that uh, my youngest son um, became very interested in music at an early age, uh, and um, he became a cellist. Um, so uh, we we I took Sean to uh, New York for cello lessons every Saturday for ten years. And uh, then when it came time to say, do I go on to conservatory or go on to liberal arts, he decided to go to a liberal arts school. So um, he took that direction. But music is still in, in the household. You know, uh, music's always being played. And um, Sean has his own. I, I know jam is probably the wrong term for piano and cello, but you guys ever just... Just oh, we, we we fool around with music, music, you know, the scores, you know, um, uh, Beethoven sonatas, you know, those type of things. And then uh, there are other musicians in the family. My uh, niece, Franchi, um, who has her master's degree from the Royal College of Music and Violin Performance, um, will play trios, you know, so from that standpoint. Oh, cool. But most of her work, uh, she just, you may want to do a, a little um, search on it. She uh, just did... Uh, a couple of the videos with Bruce Springsteen's uh, new videos, new songs. Okay. She was on tour with Madonna, uh, the Madame X tour, until they wow. had to stop it because of COVID. So um, she wow. has played with, you know, John Leg Legend, Stevie Wonder, you name it. She's she's a contract she, musician. So your family, your family's just embedded in the business. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in just all angles. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. really. Well, uh, if, if, we, if we expand upon that. Um, um, my sister Marianne, who decided to go into music, who is a, you know, a real musician, very accomplished, um, you know, uh, graduated from the Juilliard School with her bachelor's and then went to Europe to study. Uh, and all, many, many of her students, she's a cellist, um, are the, you know, principal cellists of major symphonies in um, Europe. Uh, and she's pretty well known uh, in Europe as, as a top-notch cello teacher. Um, my little sister actually sort of went the opposite direction. She's kind of rock and roll, you know, um, and she was the top mm -hmm. 10 DJ in the Los Angeles area for many years. Oh, cool. And then Jeez. my brother, who went into software, uh, was actually kind of torn because he was accepted to the Baltimore Symphony, uh, but decided to say, well, that's a crazy life. So he decided to go into software. So, um, but... Music is still with oh. us. It's it's ingrained into our, our it's 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 grain. It's just right. Yeah, here. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. At a kind of refined level too. You know, not the typical. At least, you know, most of my friends are more, you know, crash and bash rock and roll. Um, it's still music. It's music. No, no, no. It, it, it's it definitely. Yeah. It, it, it definitely yeah. is. It's just, uh, just it's it's just different, I guess, in a way. But. Um, yeah. So how did how does that get you into working with the people at Grado? Well, it started, you know, um, I decided after college uh, and during college, uh, because, you know, my father was looking at the hi-fi gear. I was selling tons of hi-fi gear out of my dorm room. You know, everybody says, I need a stereo. I said, let me help you. So um, at the time, the, the big things were AR and KLH speakers, um, you know, dual turntables that type of thing, and um, my, I kept on selling it, and then after school, you know, I said, well, what am I going to do? So I um, got a job at a place called Liberty Music, which was part of the Harvey uh, radio chain. Um, I got to know uh, 
uh, the owners um, uh, pretty well. Paul Sampson, um, Harvey Sampson Jr. was, you know, the guy who took over Harvey's. So um, that led to, you know, rising up in that food chain pretty quickly. Um, and that's how I got to know Saul, uh, Saul and Rance. Uh, and one thing led to another, and then um, Saul and I uh, became very close friends. And he, then he asked me to say, uh, well, would you come and, you know, represent us for Dahlquist at the time uh, in the New York metro oh. area? So that's how that all got started. Oh. So. And you have DQ10s. Uh, I have two pairs. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Have, yeah, cool, cool. I, ha I have my original sample pairs that I've had for close to 40 years. And um, I have another pair that are quite modified just for playing around. Hmm. So um, um, they still do th some. I didn't know. I didn't know Saul Morantz was involved with Dahlquist. He was one of the, uh, the co-founders. But that, I, I didn't know that, but that's, yeah. yeah. How that all started and, is that. I mean, they're incredible speakers. Yeah, how that all started was that Saul had, uh, you know, unfortunately uh, had to sell the uh, company to Superscope uh, after the debacle of the Morantz 10B, uh, which, you know, sort of put the company in dire financial straits. Uh, so he was looking for a, a project, and um, one of my friends um, sort of introduced Saul to John Dahlquist. And when Saul heard the uh, speakers that John Dahlquist designed, Saul was just taken aback and said, we, we got to start a company. So that's how that pretty much all yeah. began. And um, the, that final realization became the uh, Dahlquist yeah. DQ-10. Uh, and... Um, I love DQ10. They did quite yeah, well with that. So. We we sell quite a few of them. It's yeah. one of those speakers that I, I get this a lot. Um, people come in, they listen to them, and they love them. They fall in love instantly. They're like, I want those speakers. I'm going to run home with a measuring tape, and I'll call you back. And <laughs> yeah. a lot of times it comes down to, you know, either the aesthetics or the size. Because, they, you know, it's a large speaker. Yeah. But if you've got the room for a set of Dahlquist uh, in your in your space, uh, they are incredible. I think they do so well. And mainly, I mean, they fill a room. They really do. That sound stage is so big. Um, I love seeing Dahlquist come in the door. So when I saw that you had a pair, I was like, I, I get it. it. It makes sense, especially for the type, because from what I understand, you're really into, uh, you collect classical LPs. Yes. Yeah. And so yes. uh, yeah. I could see Dahlquist really, being a go-to speaker, if that was maybe my main genre, um, for sure. But you know. they're good with all kinds they of are. stuff, you know. They are. So um, they are. Yeah. So uh, from that standpoint, um, they've always been um, close to my heart, and uh, I think relevant. You know, they still sound good. Um, you know, that said, you know, there have been advances in the past forty years sure. in terms of driver technology, in terms of you know dynamic range, resolution, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, but uh, what John did was quite uncanny to put those five drivers together and yeah. make it all work. Yeah. So yeah, it was pretty it's kind cool. of a hodgepodge. There's a, you know, it's like it really, an Advent it woofer, and then there's a yes. Phillips tweeter. And I, I don't yes. remember the other well, no, one. The, it, might... the, it, was, it was a peerless tweeter. Okay. Um, uh, was there an ADS the, or Braun mid-range? Or... Uh, that was a peerless dome mid-range. Okay. And then okay. uh, the, the Phillips cone mid-range and then go. of course okay. the um all ubiquitous piezo that everybody complained about but yeah. uh, i always said if you can hear <laughs> at 15 kilohertz uh you're a better man than i <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah sure same guilty i know i can't yeah. but yeah neither can i you know i'm I'm, yeah. I'm up there in age and once you start hitting 50 it just it just yeah. gradually goes away i so, played drums but, in a rock band and it just yeah, there's nothing above there. You know, those symbols just... Yeah, but just it's just it. a lot of uh, medical technology being done in terms of um, helping, researching how to restore the cilia in your ear. So um, oh, no a lot of good research. You know, it, it actually comes out of the um, uh, research for veterans. Um, ah. You know, because, you know, in the course of, you know, if, if you're infantry or things like that or tank or, you know... Uh, uh, Some pretty concussive. Yeah, you know, sonics uh, happening there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have a son who is a uh, former U.S. Marine, 
And he said that, you know, they gave, they give them, you know, ear protection. But uh, yeah. he says in the course of if you're doing something, he did two tours in Iraq. And he says, you don't put the earplugs because you want to hear your, you know, he was a boot lieutenant at the time. Yeah. I have 10 guys that I'm responsible for. I got to know. And I know exactly where they are. If they're yelling at me sure. or they're talking to me, I got to hear them. If I have earplugs in. Forget it. I can't hear them. I, I got to know and keep myself right. completely aware of the circumstance. So, you know, he's got hearing loss. Um, so, you know, I'm yeah. hopeful that you know this research will help bring that 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 back. Well, and I think they probably, you know, you guys would know this just from the headphone technology, but you know, even um, you know, earplugs have gotten so much better. I mean, I yes. remember the, the old twist in ones, you know, when I was younger, and they were horrible. Now you can get them to where you know you're just attenuating certain exactly. frequencies yeah. so you still can pick up details but you're getting rid of those harmful you know big yeah uh, you it's know just, uh, what well, explosions yeah, it's what, just whatever. The sheer energy but, that can break the cilia in, in your yeah. ears so uh and they don't grow back so yeah. um there's a lot of technology that right uh, right uh, they're trying to help uh with hearing loss it's a big thing and then that's sort of uh you know looking at this whole area is just that I, i'm so helpful and hopeful and ha happy that the technology that um, our industry has brought forth in terms of true wireless stereo, Bluetooth, and things like that, that hearing aids become much more affordable for uh, people because um, I know with my dad when in his later years had uh, was very hard of hearing, but you know how many people can go out and afford $3,000, $4,000 for a set of hearing aids? Uh, and you and I know that... Yeah. Well, you know, I know the technology and those things, the chipsets are worth about $30 and, you know, the drivers probably maybe $10. How does that translate to $3,000? And then, of course, you have to go see the audiologist yeah. uh, to, you know, do the equalization yeah. and, and, the and, then they, and, all. and yeah. you know, the chips have the DSP built into it already. So it's just a matter of programming. But now um, I know Sony has gotten into uh uh, the business and there are others following suit and uh, it's a good thing for for everybody because hearing is so important and i'll tell your your uh oh God. your friends and people who are watching your channel always protect your hearing always 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 do not absolutely just crank this stuff up and if you go to yeah. a concert where you know noise reducing earplugs and things like that you still can enjoy because not only do our ears hear but our brain hears so you feel that bone conduction and all that stuff that your body feels that uh, you know, adds to the the live experience. So yep. uh, hearing protection is very, very important. Yeah, and what I think what you don't realize when you're younger too and not, you know, after five minutes of getting those decibels over 110, 120, you're, you might as well just had the earplugs in the whole time because, yeah. you know, yeah, it sounds a little bit muffled when you first do it, but um, after getting bashed with, yeah, you acclimate, exactly. Whereas uh, yeah. it, you're going to acclimate whether you got plugs in or not. It's just one's going to be a permanent damage, and the other one you're going to pop the earplugs out, and you're going to have your hearing back. So yeah. uh, I agree with you 100. <laughs> percent Yeah. So yeah. you'll have you know you want to be able to enjoy your stereo and your music for um, a, a long, 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 long time. So uh, yeah. protect your hearing. Uh, if anything Absolutely. that comes out of our our interview, protect your hearing. <laughs> um. I, I, we should probably talk about cartridges, even though sure. um, I don't want my the audience to get pissed off, even though I would rather just sit here and talk about <laughs> um, what we've been talking about. But um, I, I got I, I do have some questions for you. Sure. And uh, I've got a guy that I've got a few guys that come in and they say, Kevin, I think it's Grotto. <laughs> and I, I, I say, I, I don't think so. I think it's Grado. And if I say techniques, I get a million people online that says it's Technics. Is it Grado or is it Grotto? It's with a long A. It's Grado. So, it's Grado. And that's, that's what great. I thought because there's a really nice lady that answers the phone. Carrie. Um, when I've, is yeah. it Carrie? Okay. Carrie. Carrie. You can kind of, she, oh, I'm sorry. Um, has she yeah. been there a while? Yeah. For oh, a, you can about kinda, 10 years. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. I've talked to other people that have talked to her. And they've had the same experience, which is this lady's awesome. You know, she's Thank really you. sweet. She's really nice. And it doesn't seem like you don't expect it, at least, you know, uh, and that's 
one of my favorite things about Grado. I mean, we have a, a few different product lines. We we don't have a lot of new product, but I love selling Grado product Thank you. for a lot of reasons. And, and one of the main reasons is, you know, the aftercare or the, the customer service you guys give. And it starts with that first phone call. As soon as I talked to her, I was like, holy cow. You know, I mean, this really is kind of a, it, it feels mom and pop and she's super sweet. And Eric, um, the guy who's working the show right now, producing the show, um, he sent his headphones in. I think five years ago, he said, you know, and talked to her on the phone. She said, he said, uh, she had me in and out the door ready to go. And uh, I sent my headphones in with like 25 bucks and I got them back with new wires on it. He was like, it was the greatest experience ever from, you know, a product that I had already owned for five years. And I've had the same experience too, with a lot of different things, um, you know, involving cartridges and everything. So, um, I, I love that part about Grado. Um, I wish more companies got back to that. I don't know where my question is in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll find one. I think I just got, um, I got stuck on how great Grado is, which it happens. What do you think of the vinyl resurgence? You know, uh, you guys are a company that obviously has a lot of skin in the game. Um, I know headphones have done really well for you guys. But, um, you know, what's your kind of thoughts on the resurgence and kind of where do you see things going? Uh, I vinyl? think the final resurgence is, is, is wonderful. I think that people discovering albums, it's a whole different process is how we uh, consume our, our music. And I think from my perspective, having seen the whole arc of vinyl from, you know, when I got into this, uh, this endeavor um, and, you know, it was nothing but al albums, and the other source was FM uh, radio. Uh, so uh, then I s we saw the uh, the surge of cassettes, and you know people recording their albums onto cassettes, you know doing their their mixtapes and things like that, and then you know to the CDs and now streaming and things like that. Um, it, it's I think it's important to understand that what I see in terms of the vinyl uh, resurgence, it's ritual is that in our lives, we need to have um, an antithesis to our daily digital consumption. So when we get home, we take that album, we look at it, we open it up and we read the, the liner notes, um, we take the album out, and then we put it on the, uh, the turntable, the platter, and we clean it, uh, then we put the arm on and, and, and we listen to it. You know, I always tell people, that's foreplay. <laughs> and when you get all that done, you get that, that yeah. you know, sensation of, of intimacy that you can't get with, you know, streaming or just throwing that CD in the tray and boom, it's, 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 it's in the CD player. Uh, I think we need that in our lives. And I think that's why vinyl is so important to people. That said, you know, five years from now, I do have a fear from the standpoint that um, it's like anything else. Uh, the demand for albums, uh, especially the, the vintage albums, the prices have come, become prohibitive. You know, uh, my colleague, Rich Grado, who is a Steely Dan uh, aficionado, last summer says, I wanted to get that album. Uh, and then something happened, he just didn't get around to it. You know, back then it was like 30 bucks. And it, like, uh, two months ago, I said, John, I want to get the album. It's now $100. Uh, I think you've seen it. I think you're, some of your audience know that some of these albums are getting pricier and pricier and pricier, and that sort of you know, prices people out. You know, you're not going to spend fifty dollars to hundred dollars on an album. Uh, it, it, that just doesn't make sense. And you know, um, so from that standpoint, I hope that the record companies realize that you know when they have to put out these reissues. Don't make it crazy money. Make it affordable so that people can still enjoy it and, and still build up their, their libraries and have something that they can uh, collect and, and cherish. That's my fear is just that all this stuff gets pushed out of the, the realm of you know, people who are enjoying it and like the hobby and like going to uh, uh, the flea markets and the, um, uh, the, the secondhand stores and things like that, the Salvation Armies, you know, where people donate it, you know, people... You know, who start to age out. I know a lot of people 
um, you know, said, I, I can't deal with the albums any longer, so I have to um, find a, a home for these things. Um, so that's happening. We, we see that the maturation of the market. So uh, from the standpoint that I won't give my albums up that readily, but I put all my CDs away. You know, uh, they're in storage. I, I stream now from that standpoint. Uh, and, um, you know, I have a CD player, but it's it's like I, I don't even touch it now. So, um so from that standpoint, in terms of the medium, um, you know, hopefully that uh, the medium doesn't get too expensive, you know. And, 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 you know, if you go on Discogs and things like that, you look at how much do they want for that album? It's like, I hope that it hasn't, let's say, the speculation push these things up and there's, there, there's a bubble. Maybe that's good. Uh, but um, uh, I think it's harder and harder for people to, to, to consume that. I think I think you're right in that you know the the original pressings are just going to continue to go up as they become collectible as they get shipped as they get damaged as they get played you know it, it, it's like vintage stereo equipment um, you know the the more they get sold on eBay and Discogs sure. and all that kind of stuff the more they're getting damaged and the the numbers are just going down um, you know right now we do have people come into the store because we sell new vinyl and a lot of times we'll hear and it's usually you know, the older generation will say, holy cow, $30 for a record, you know, and it's kind of, I always go back to my dad who says, you know, cheeseburgers are $1.50, whether they're five, dozen. you know, and, yeah. you know, with eggs being $8 for a dozen, I know that's kind of a, a, a yeah, you know, a rare one. Um, but if, yes. if you do put the $30 into an inflation calculator, exactly. it's kind of what I was paying for a record in 1980. And, you know, the kids are coming in um and and buying yeah. you know they'll drop 200 bucks on records like it's nothing and I, I, I you know to me it even i jolt a little bit at that you know but um so i i you know and i i totally understand what you're saying i but i i do think there is hope that i think the younger generation is grabbing this and going back to your your ritualistic um side of vinyl and i i agree with you on that the cool thing is is it's not nostalgic in that for these right kids now. they're gravitating towards something tangible that they've never experienced yeah. where we're going back and we're going yeah. i remember that and there's there's a nostalgia pull there um the 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 good thing and what, why i think records are going to continue to go good you know keep fingers crossed um is that you know the kids are gravitating to it too that you don't need the nostalgia element for people to see the value in sitting yeah. down in front of a turntable yeah. with a 12 inch piece of art and absorbing it like like you're saying so i i, ho I hope we're good you know um if not it, it seems like you know the headphone aspect for grado yep. is is gonna do just fine especially with you know the portability of having, you know, like you're saying, streaming, you know, my CDs are parked away too. You know, at this point, the streaming's gotten so good that, you know, why bother grabbing a disc um, when I'm not, I'm not getting anything different for better or worse. Vinyl has a different playback sound because it's analog, obviously. And, um, but with going from, you know, and some people will argue with me that CDs are different than, you know, a lossless file, but uh, that's for somebody else to want to argue that. To me, they sound the same. Um, but, you know, it, I, I'm glad to see that, you know, the headphones are great. I, I, I use Grado headphones, um, and to me, they are just kind of a, a different breed with the, you know, they sound like more like a, a speaker system to me. And they don't feel like they're, you know, my ears are sweating and being closed off and the music's in my ears. They do sound like the sound is coming from outside of my ears. And I always appreciate that because um, it has more of an authentic feel rather than feeling like somebody's singing or playing sure. in my ear. Um, hey, absolutely. But I'm gonna, I've got some questions from um, the audience we did um, online. And... Um, Let's see. So, and you guys have cartridges in the, you know, the 10 plus thousand dollar range, and there's several manufacturers out there making 10 plus thousand dollar cartridges. Obviously, some, some people are buying them. My question really is, is 
what could possibly be inside or what labor could have cost that much to create something that's literally three quarters of an inch by half an inch? <laughs> I think that um, there are processes that uh, people don't get to see. For example, uh, the suspension material that we use in the um, lineage series of uh, phono cartridges, which is the statement, the uh, Aeon and the Epoch, that is, you know, pure rubber that we've aged for about 20 years. So there's a certain stash there that's, mm. you know, it's going to be a finite uh, amount of rubber that we turn the suspensions fr into from that rubber. So, um, you know, it's like a, a fine wine. You got you got to age it. And so uh, there are costs involved with that. It's the cost of, you know, um, the, the, the coils are, are, are hand wound. So there's a lot of... Uh, attention to detail uh, in terms of assembling this this stuff, and um, the other thing is that you're paying for the uh, you know the IP, and there are other you know considerations in terms of the supply chain. So um, that's how these things end up being ten thousand, twelve thousand you know dollars for a, a cartridge, or you know fifty thousand dollars for a turntable, um, or you know, you, we've seen the the prices of some of these things. Uh, and th there are people out there who will, you know, uh, spend this kind of money. I saw a uh, a video um, just two days ago on an audio note. It was a three hundred thousand dollars system, you know, uh, tube amplifiers, things like that, speakers. So, um, you know, how you translate it? There are multipliers that you have to uh, understand. Uh, that's involved with any kind of product uh, product that's out there. You know, what are the raw costs, what are the cost of materials, and then the, you assign uh, the cost of overhead. Um, and, you know, people are in business to, to make a profit. Sure. So uh, without that profit, we can't stay in business. We can't invest in, in to research and designs. You know, we can't pay people. Uh, and having a plant in New York City, uh, you know, you know suburb of these, is quite expensive. You know, we pay real wages. We support the community, uh, health care. You know, so uh, it's not a sweatshop. Yeah, no, you know, no. <laughs> uh, we're not paying. I, 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 yeah. So those things all take our uh, our our considerations. Yeah, I, I, I'm no means trying to you know put you on the spot with that that question. It, it just no, is no, a, no. I I think it's just a you know it, it's like yeah, no, I, I, I think it, Macintosh. It, it, you know, where people say is you know is there really the and it, a lot of it is fit and finish. You know, and I, but you know with a cartridge being so small. Um, you do, you do just kind of have to wonder, and you guys are not alone. There's a lot of companies out there, you know, with, with, uh, with cartridges in that price bracket and, and other products. Yeah. Uh, so there's gotta be something there. I was just curious if there was an easy way to explain what it is that is in there that, that does justify that, you know, it's the, it's the human, the human aspect of it. Um, it's the, um, you know, one person that does it, um, that has to spend the time uh, and the, the overhead that's associated with it. If we wanted to call out some of our competitors who do this, you know, there's a Japanese company quite well known. They make a fabulous product line. Uh, that's all they do. So maybe there are two or three, you know, little Japanese guys or women. They're very carefully winding the coils. How many can sure. they produce in a day? Um maybe two or three, um, they still have to pay, you know, rent in Tokyo or wherever, which is fabulously expensive, uh, just as a sidebar. Yeah. Side um, I have a tone arm that I use. It's my go-to tone arms made by Jelco. Um, They're out of business uh, Jelco, now, right? Uh, yeah. about a year and a half ago. Yeah. They closed. And the, the, the little lady who owned Jelco, you know, and decided because a lot of her workforce was starting to age out. There were master craftsmen said, I'm going to sell the company or I'm just going to shut it down because the real estate here in Tokyo, my building is worth more yeah. than the business. So she got more for yeah. the building than for her business. She just shut it down. You know, she was in her seventies and says, that's enough. I've had enough. So, you know, so that drives the, the cost of everything that we see in this, industry, especially at the, the upper echelons of this equipment. Um, not many people are doing that. Uh, the supply chain, um, 
uh, right now, uh, diamonds are not cheap. You know, the cantilevers are not cheap. Um, you're, you're talking about boron, you know, uh, sapphire, rubies that you have to grow uh, in order to make the cantilevers. And we use gold coils. You know, we use Swiss um, turned uh, uh, machine parts. Um, we use absolutely pure ferrous iron in our generators. Uh, so there are about 30 different parts in a cartridge. So yeah, you, you got to pull all that together, and you know, um, you, you got to front that yeah. money <laughs> up front before they you, know, you do anything before it even comes a product. You know, uh, the molding machines you're going to spend a quarter of a million dollars for a molding machine. So, um, and then you got to pay the people to run those molding machines. So uh, uh, there are costs involved, and and it's not like, you know, with these people uh, in that upper echelon of phono cartridges. They're selling tens of thousands sure. of these. They're selling, you know, a few hundred every month total yeah. worldwide. Yeah. So um, you you, you got to price it accordingly in order to keep your doors open. And again, there there is a uh, uh, a clientele out there who who yeah. you know, that that's their passion. So they'll they'll go out and I know I talk to customers that have four or five of these kind of cartridges in their collection. That's crazy, you know. They're ten thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. I got this one. I got this one. I got this one. I and it's like you know, this is what they collect. This is like, um, I got friends who collect Rolex Daytonas. Sure. <laughs> they not. They don't have one. They got a dozen of them. Yeah, isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's a different. And those are forty. Yeah, that's there's forty thousand yeah. dollars a piece. Yeah. We get people that come in, you know, and the, on the on an opposite end of the scale. But still, uh, it's it's almost that same mentality. I've had I literally had this guy walk in. and He goes, "I want the most expensive cartridge you have." And I literally I stepped back. You know, I'm the worst salesman ever. I really am. I because and I think I said to him, "I'm like, why? I mean, do you want the best sounding cartridge? You don't. You didn't tell me what kind of turntable. You didn't tell me anything. You just said you wanted the yeah. most expensive cartridge." And I think that mentality gets carried over into the audio world you know and, and for right or wrong it, it's just part of the way humans are you know that we trust in a brand that if you pay more than you're getting a better quality you know and um you know i think that is why it is so important to do maybe a little bit of homework on the brand you're purchasing you know and and see you know are there, are they valid in in charging what they're charging and i think with grado you know i wouldn't I, I just don't question um I don't question it like I would from maybe a company I've never heard of or a pop up from from an outside country for whatever reason that is I'm not sure um so as far as my uh we a lot of customers that we're getting now are they've been in the hobby for a long time and they're kind of relearning everything. You know, we get that a lot. You know, I I, I had turn I sold my turntables 20, 30 years ago. Right. And, the, and they'll come in right. and, and they'll say, you know, where is the sweet spot in the Grado line? They're looking at the cartridges there. Um, you know, and they're just kind of looking for that the bang for their buck. You know, it yeah. The, what what it, where where would you steer them if uh if if they came and asked you that? For that kind of uh client, I would definitely recommend to Look at the Grado Gold 3 very seriously and the Opus 3. Uh, with the fixed stylus in the Opus, it does reduce resonances. It makes it more articulate, uh, more transparent. Um, though, because of the bigger chassis, the more mass, you have to be uh, turntable sensitive about that. The Gold is truly the, the best bang for the buck. We put a really good generator on that. Uh, we put a good stylus on it. Uh, so it really sounds great. You know. Uh, and for those customers that, um, you know, have, are pulling out their 40 year old turntables, um, between you and me and everybody who, who may be listening in and, and will be watching this, um, uh, I always recommend the black. You know, um, I don't necessarily go to the blue or the red or even the green because, you know, uh, when we do our evaluations on these cartridges, there are differences. You can hear them. But I am using a modified BPI turntable. I use a 12 Jellico 12 inch um, a fluid damp tone arm. I can hear these differences, you know. And um, so, 
I, I know that they're there. On a 40-year-old year old turntable who's being just taken out of the closet, the bearings in your tonar may be a little dirty, and you know they're you know you don't know what's loose in the turntable and things like that. Things might be rattling around that you don't it may look solid, but you know all those resonances do get into the system and sort of cloud up the sound. So um, from that standpoint, um, yeah, um, you, your best bet is to go to a Grado Black. Just go and get it done. Enjoy, spin a few records. Uh, and from there, if you want to start to step up and looking into uh, new turntables, by all means, I think some uh, there are very good turntables out there from many manufacturers, uh, and they all do a great job. And it's just you know how much money you want to spend and how deep you want to get into this, and so you have to balance it accordingly. You know, um, most people just want to have uh, some fun spending some um, LPs and um, get their system going again and uh, sort of sit back and, you know, like you said, have that nostalgia, open up the album cover. And, yeah. and I hear it all the time. Um, I remember when I first opened this album, and I hear it, you know, it says, I was in this place doing this, and these were the people around me where we were doing this, and, and we listened to uh, this particular album. I hear it every day without fail, that how that that music connects you to a time and place that's important to your soul. So um, yeah. don't worry. Don't get into the weeds with, with this stuff. You know, find, find, find your space, find, find your, your spot uh, and, and enjoy it. So yeah. um, that's the most important thing. Keep it yeah, simple. Keep it simple. Yep. Yep. I, I've had customers walk in and they go, you know, I want to upgrade my system and you know, like, well, what, you know, what do you want to improve on it? Well, you know, I really, it sounds really good. I really like it. You know, I just, and I go, stop, <laughs> you know, what are you, what are you doing? You found it. You know how many people I know that would kill to be content with their, you know, once you, it's kind of like, um, you know, I had a, I had an older friend of mine that was a real ladies man. And I, at the time I was really young and I kind of looked up to him and I thought, you know, man, he's got the life, you know, he's got all these women around and all this stuff. And I remember, you know, he said to me, he's like, you know, I'm probably going to be single the rest of my life because I'm always going to be grabbing different things that I liked about these different people I spent time with and trying to find one that encapsulates all of it is going to be difficult. And I kind of feel that way. You know, the more speakers I listen to, the more uh, amplifiers I listen to, the more I'm trying to find take all the little things I loved about each one of those things and get it in one. Yeah. And it just doesn't, it doesn't uh, exist. A, a good little story for you. Um, because of my you know background, you know, I got to know the who's who of hi-fi dealers in the New York area. Uh, and one of the, you know, premier uh, guys that everybody knew about was Mike K at Lyric Hi-Fi. And he was a pretty smart guy. I would say, in fact, he was a, a very, very smart guy. And one day we were just sort of shooting the breeze and he sat down and says, I love this business. I said, uh, why, Mike? Because what audiophiles do is they just chase colorations. This is the new coloration of the week. Next week is going to be different. Next week. So they always constantly want to change their equipment. So I'm just going to be here and just let it drop into my lap. So um, I think he sort of pegged it to that for you know, people out there. Don't chase the colorations. Don't chase this thing, you know, everybody says, well, this cable is better than that cable. This is, this is, and, and I, I say to people, okay, what is a cable? It's a piece of wire. Okay. Well, what's so special about this cable over that? They're both pieces of wire. And I say, well, first of all, a cable has three components. And, and when you boil it down, it's resistance, capacitance, and inductance. And I ask them usually, I says, what's that? And they just look at me. Well, you just said capacitance. I said, that's a filter. And they go, and then their eyes light up, a filter. Every different cable is a different filter. You know, all those parameters, you know, you got an algorithm. I change the capacitance up, change it down. What's a capacitor? It's a high pass filter. What's an inductor? It's a low pass filter. What's a, res you know, a resistor? It just slows the, it slows the flow. cuts the yeah. signal down. Yeah, so... From that standpoint, what's a cable? It's a filter. So some cables have different filter 
personalities than other cables. So what works in your system, let it work. And what if you keep changing out your, your cables, it's just going to sound different. It doesn't necessarily sound better. It's just different. And then so Mike K just understood that, says they're just going to chase different colorations. That's right. That's all it right. is. I, I, one of our techs um, also does repair work. Um, well, he used to do guitar amplifiers, and he said <laughs> he can't do it anymore because they, you know, musician comes in and they say, well, it used to be brown. And after you change the capacitors, now it sounds too orange. And <laughs> that's what that reminds Colorations. Yeah, yes, exactly. Colorations. And, you know, a technician, you know, that's looking at a schematic and sees everything in math, looks at that and goes, there's no amount, you know, I can't put a 47 microfarad capacitor in there to make it more orange. That that orange, doesn't, right. that doesn't compute. You're two different languages, but that's, I don't know. That's one of the great mysteries of um, music uh, equipment, I guess, you know. It's chasing the holy grail. It is. That's yep. all you're doing. Yep. You're chasing, it is. You're chasing the holy grail. That's right. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So, and that's why I tell people, go to live concerts. Yeah. Have yeah. a nice hi-fi system. And then have the experience. Sort of remember it. Bring it home. Put music on. And, and you just continue that that whole thing. And, and it frees yourself. It just frees your soul. You know, so yeah. um, enjoy the music. And, uh, and and everywhere in the United States, there's always music. There's always music going on. So you can find it, you know, whether it's at the local church or at the local school, uh, New York City or the metro cities. Or at your always. house there's for family stuff. gatherings, it sounds like. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we have a lot of fun, you know, so we have good food and we have a lot of fun. And uh, um, we... Uh, we trade stories and it's just good to get together from that standpoint. And, and it's, it's like, you know, today's high five, when I think about it was, you know, we're so lucky, you know, because we can, everybody can, you know, afford something, whether it be a transistor radio, uh, a boom box or, you know, stuff that you can put together on a vintage level, you know, modern stuff, you know, there was a time when none of this existed, you know, and the, you know, they would have to go to church to hear music. They would have to, you know, the only pe people that could really afford to have an orchestra were the, you know, the you know, royalty, the princes and the barons and the kings. You know, how does some of this uh, music get written? You know, uh, Emperor Franz Joseph, you know, commissioned Mozart to do this and this and this. And then the famous words, too many notes, my dear Mozart. You know, those are the only people that could get that experience. You know, the peasants didn't, you know, I consider myself yeah. a peasant, you know, I'm not the royalty, you know, so from that standpoint, we are truly blessed. So go out there Absolutely. and assemble your own orchestra or your own band. And it's two speakers, a, a beautiful Marantz receiver or Sansui or whatever, a Yamaha. They're all good. They're all very good. Yeah. When you think yeah. about these companies like a Yamaha, Yamaha or, you know, at the time, Sansui, Kenwood, you name it. These were powerhouses. They yeah. had engineers out the wazoo. They knew what they yeah. were doing. You, you think about well, the speakers. Yeah, go ahead. They had to audition it. Yeah, they had but, to audition it. You would you would go in and listen to it. Yeah. You know, anymore, you just, you know, you get on Amazon or your online store and you look and see which codec the receiver has, if it has AirPlay or <laughs> Spotify, and uh, I need five channels plus a subwoofer, and that's how you pick it. Yeah. You know, back then it was FM was a big deal and yeah. going into a going into a store and listening to the phono section of an amplifier was a big deal. And they had to compete against each other. Yes. They don't have to compete against each other anymore. Yeah, we a lot of that, at, at, that at the yeah. commercial level. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. a lot of that has been taken away because it's so much of it's done online. Uh, so yeah. um, but again, uh, these these are real companies. Um, they they put their hearts and souls into it. You know, um, there was so much good stuff out there. You know, Sony. You know, it's you can't go wrong. You really can't go wrong. No, uh, uh. You know, no. Uh, with, that was the golden era. Yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, I have a uh, a fifty year old Luxman integrated amplifier, the um, five hundred seven. It's a little forty watt per channel, um, built like a tank. 
uh, and that's my, you know, my sitting room upstairs um, system uh, that I have a pair of uh, Kef LS 50s. And I only got the LS 50s because a buddy of mine for the longest time just kept on bugging me. And bugging me. You got to sell me your LS 35. I, I had an original pair mm. of LS 35A Roger 16 ohms. And he, he gave me stupid money for it. I said, okay, you know, okay, just to, and, you know, my buddy at, um, I have a very close friend, Alec Chan, who owns Kef. And I said, Alex, I need a pair of LS50s LS because I heard good things about them. So I got them. They're, they're very good speakers. Uh, so it's, it's a great little system. I actually just use an iPad going out from, yeah. out from the headphone output right into the Luxman. I'm done. And yeah. I'm surprised how yeah. good it is. And then, you know, from yep. that standpoint, you, when I think about it, you know, I've had, um, you know, in my position at Grado, we've had Apple come and visit us. And you have to know that, and I want to tell your, your, your audience, Apple takes very seriously what they do. You know, they have a real audio yeah. engineering team there. So uh, from that yeah. standpoint, you know, don't get too much into it. I got to have an outboard deck. I got to have this. I got to have that. You know, you'd be surprised how good your phone sounds, how good that iPad sounds. Um, it's, it's very good. And if you want to expand upon that, great. You know, go out and find a nice stack. Nice amplifier because it's it's they're nice they're, they're, they're it's fun to have the, these little you know devices and um, so from that and try different colors exactly you know um, it, it's fun yeah. it's a lot of fun so um, it's all it's all good you know um, and you know uh, you don't get into the the pissing match and saying this device is better than that device because when you come back to it you know, with with DAX but how many people out there make the chipsets six seven you know yeah, they're, they're, right. it's all the same you know it's, it's, it's a chipset yeah and, it and sure just is op amps yep uh, okay some people might yep. be a little bit more clever at how they design the power supply to supply these op amps and things sure. like that and the packaging and things like that uh, so um you know but it's nuance and a lot of people i don't think you know myself included um, I don't. I don't have a controlled room. It's not treated. I know I have limitations of being able to pick up nuances, and so I try. And my bottleneck is yeah. my room. You know, everybody has a bottleneck, and so there's no point for me to try and upgrade anything until I get past my bottleneck, which is my room. And it. It. it I only say that because we do. I do have people come in the store sometimes, and they'll be like, "Man, I heard you know online that." I need to get this or I need to get that. And I know the customer system and I know the room it's in. And I, I don't, it's not my place to say you're not going to hear the difference because uh, your room has no absorption at all. And it's got 15 foot ceilings and all that stuff. So I, I don't say anything, but you know, um, it does seem like, People get stuck in trying to find something better based. And, and no, I, I think you, you make a valid, valid point with the room, you know, and there's so many different things that you can do probably that you have already existing in your house to treat your room. You know, you may have a few extra area rugs that you're not using, throw them down on the floor. Absolutely. You know, um, then this, you look at your speakers, you know, get a, um, a mirror and slide it along the wall First uh, reflections. Uh, you know, you look at your first reflections. Same thing on the ceiling, and just put some, uh, put a curtain up there, you know. And then behind the curtain, you can put fiberglass, or you know, if you had extra ceiling tile or things like that. But rug treatments, you know, those type of things, you know, um, tube traps, you know, go out and make your own. You know, go yeah. out to the, the local uh, Lowell's or Home Depot. You get a you know eight inch, eight inch tube. Put a lot of holes, stuff with fiberglass. You know, you start to break up those modes, and they're fun, interesting projects. Maybe that's something you can do in your store. It says, here, we got some, you know, uh, concrete, you know, formers. Uh, uh, get some, you know, uh, you can use polyester fiber fill or, you know, fiberglass. Yeah. Put it in the corners, yeah. you know, um, things like that, and, and get them going. So from that standpoint, there are a lot of little things that you can do to improve your system without Absolutely. spending a whole lot of music. Absolutely. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes you get stuck, you know, the aesthetics committee won't let you 
make changes <laughs> like that to uh, to the room. But that that's put that's it, put another. a chair then then put a mm-hmm. chair in the corner. You know, and then stack some <laughs> yeah. Put, yeah. stack yeah. some stack some magazines so you can break up the uh, the uh, the standing ways. It's, it's yep. So many different ways, that, or put a plant. You know, plants are yeah. great for breaking up those um, all the bounce around. You know, I've seen many systems. You know, and, and been many situations where um, they they just couldn't put. So I say to the client, let's put a lot of plants here, and it, it makes it look great. It's actually good for your environment because plants do give feng shui. Take, yeah, yeah, feng shui. They take in the carbon dioxide. They give off oxygen. So it's yeah. it's all a good thing. It makes you water the plant and nurture the plant, and it just makes everything look nice. So put a lot of plants around. So uh, there are so many different ways to uh, help your system without you know uh, being uh, constantly spending money. Well, constantly yeah, churning. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not necessarily yeah. an upgrade. So you know, so uh, yeah. you don't want to get into you know. I remember back in the day the. The amp, you know, the wattage wars. You know, I got 50 watts. Now I need oh, 100 yeah. watts. And I said, "Well, can you really hear the 3 dB difference?" You know, <laughs> yeah. right? So, You're not going to use more than 15 anyway. Exactly. But, so, yeah. So uh, these are all good. Just get a good amplifier, and 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 then get a good turntable, and uh, and buy some albums and, and enjoy. It, it really just comes down to just try to enjoy it. It, yeah, because as soon as you take it too seriously, you're going down a rabbit hole that you'll never find the end of. Just, just enjoy. It's just music. <laughs> How do you clean a stylus? Well, it, uh, I usually recommend um, for uh, our people calling in and saying, "How do you do that?" Um, there are a couple things. Um, one for advanced people. One for uh, you know, just <laughs> fingertip. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Um, I usually just recommend, you know, get a dry, stylish brush. You can, yeah. you know, I'm sure you have them in the store. Um, or else, you know, a very, very fine artist brush and just dab it in alcohol to dissolve some of the baked on, um, you know, lacquer that's on, on the um, diamond. Um, and back in the day, I would actually just take a matchbook, the emery on it, and just oh. drag uh, the diamond on that because the diamond's harder than the emery and oh, sure. that emery would scrape off the, the lacquer on the oh. diamond. But I don't recommend that to a lot of people because if your hands are not steady, you can't see what's going on. Don't do it. Yep. Just take this, just, just use the, the brush. brush. Get the silos. Right. That said, the most important thing, and uh, I'm sure this is a huge debate. Try to keep your LPs clean, you know, find yeah. some methodology that you're happy with, whether it's ultrasonic, whether it's you know, vacuuming, or it's a dry brush, or I'm not sure that wood glue is a good idea. But yeah, I've done there it. Are people... <laughs> yeah, I've done it just to try it. Yeah. I wanted to try it. Yeah. So and it does work to... great, but it's a mess. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, the most important thing is keep your LPs clean because once you have that grit, that acts like sandpaper on your diamond. And after a while, it wears the diamond out because I, I think I forget the, the exact. Um, number, but uh, it does expand the grooves. It gets like to you know a thousand degrees Fahrenheit at that point of contact, and it's nearly like a ton per square inch. When you look at the diamond and the pressure, yeah, I if you do the math, I think it's like a ton per square inch that is yeah. exerting on that groove. So that's um, crazy. Yeah, so you need to to keep your albums clean. Um, get some nice you know um, acid free. Uh, vinyl cover uh, covers for your inserts, you know, put it in a poly sleeve, you know, preserve those because you've made an investment in, in, in that collection. Yeah. So preserve them, keep them nice, you know, and don't get your greasy fingers on them. <laughs> How don't do you know when it's time thing. to change your stylus? Um, when it starts mistracking. When you hear mistracking, okay. uh, especially at the end of a record, that's where the, the most difficult part of an LP is. Uh, and that's usually the time to to just change it when you hear it. You know, it's just the, the sibilance gets more pronounced, um, and it, it's it's worn. The inner groove distortion inner, is that pick up? Is that what you're? Yeah, I, absolutely, I, that's exactly. The inner groove distortion okay. uh, comes way up, but you'll hear it right from the get go that it's just not tracking. That's the time to replace it. I gotcha. Usually, you know, yeah, that, most diamonds will last about two thousand hours. So. That's what they say. And I, I have people come in, they go, will you look at this, you know, and see if this is good? And I'm like, 
Yeah, I mean, I can I can look at it. You know, I've got a micro, you know, a mm. little loop, yeah. but uh, it's, you gotta it's still to it. kind of an. Yeah. Okay. Just listen to it. Well, I'm I'm gonna refer him to. Yeah, that's what I usually say. I'm like, is it, you know, does it sound good? You know, is there is the high end still there? Or is it yeah. sound like it's rolled off? You know. Yeah. Once but, you hear that, if it doesn't, if it's not sounding right, that's the time to to change it. So don't don't get into the group. You know, don't get into the weeds with it. It's time to change it. Uh, everybody's so buried in the weeds, they're never going to get out, you know. Um, just a couple more quick questions sure. for you. I've got so many, but I, no, I know we ahead. need to wrap up. No, no, uh, I, I'm um, here for you. I I, I love it. Um, you guys own the, and I, I say, uh, Grado owns um, the patent on the moving coil, I think, right? Is that correct? Um, that is correct, um, and I will qualify that. Joe Grado patent the stereo moving coil cartridge many oh. years ago okay and we didn't not the mono no the stereo oh. okay so okay. many many years ago when that was patented that's what he ran with uh and then after a while um he we went over to the moving iron and the reason for that is is that in his work with the stereo moving coil cartridge there was a resonance that he just could not cure and uh, he just said it's inherent in all moving coil cartridges. And if you take a step back and you look at how a moving coil cartridge, a stereo moving coil cartridge, loads into a phono stage, there's always capacitance. You have to load it with capacitance. Why? Because it has a rising top end. A capacitor is a high pass filter. So you put the capacitor in line with the moving coil cartridge. What does that do? It rolls the highs off. So Joe didn't like doing that. So when we he finally perfected the moving iron, our cartridges need zero capacitance, you know, uh, save for the fact that most input impedances on input on, on most uh, two preamplifiers and just the plain capacitance and cables is about 100 picofarads. You know, of course, with 12 AX7s, you have the Hall effect, which has, you know, some capac uh, capacitance that's inherent in, in the tube and how it works together. So with our cartridges, um, you don't want to load them with any capacitance whatsoever because we are linear by design. So it's a flat response curve on the cartridges. Whereas with moving coils and some moving irons, uh, a moving co uh, moving magnets, they have a, a rising top end that needs to be tamed a little bit. So you put a hundred picofarads up to up to a thousand picofarads to just smooth it out. Yeah, that's why Joe went with. Yeah, some of the nicer phono preamps you have adjustments. Yeah. You know, for the audience out there that's maybe wondering what um, you can adjust uh, the capacitance inside of the phono exactly. preamp. Yeah. And and you're saying yeah, um, just to leave it for for a grado cartridge. Is, yeah, for if you yeah. for a grado. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I'm, I'm at what, you know. Why, and 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 this is this is a you know a, a genuine question of if if a lower frequency or if a lower output is more susceptible to outside interference, why would a low level output be superior to a high level output in referring to, you know, moving coil or a low level output. Um, why, why um, do that? I don't have a specific um, answer in terms of a, you know, a, uh, you know, an engineering um, explanation or, a, you know, a explanation based on physics. We just, you know, we have compared our, our low output cartridges to our high output cartridges. And we've always found that the low output cartridges um, have more transparency. Um, it, uh, and that's very important. This is the transparency. It, it's the low level definition. Um, maybe it's because it gets a signal out faster. There's less, you know, copper, you know, that mm. it has to go through. So uh, from that standpoint, that's very important. It's just that low level information microdynamics micro single is very important because those are the cues that create space that's all about head response transfer function 
you know, it's it's how we as human beings survived as, you know, out in the wild, hearing, you know, those predators that were going to eat us, you know, lions, tigers, bears, oh my, um, that we could localize mm-hmm. when that that predator, you know, uh, step on a stick and you know, it cracked. That difference between that sound coming to this ear and that ear, there's a small difference. That's how we localize. That came over here. It's the differences in time um, between our two ears. And that's, you know, between, you know, these ears, there is a time frame. It's head response transfer function. That's how we localize uh, sound. And you're going to find more and more um, people trying to recreate that as, you know, uh, you, you, Apple has that right now. It's the... Uh, their 3D sound, you know, there are a lot of companies, Dolby has, you know, there are different methodologies in terms of how that's that's done. And in, in many respects, it, what it is, is that um, it's the crosstalk between stereo speakers that uh, sort of um, causes that confusion between our ears. So you don't get that, that localization. So um, in many respects, good speakers are very narrowly, if you look at the polar response, uh, they're very directional, so there's very little crosstalk. So, um, from that standpoint, um, mm. the, the cartridges, when they have those microdynamics, those micro cues, that's what gives the space. I see. No, that's really cool. I never, I mean, that's a really cool explanation, too. Um, I mean, I, I, that makes sense. Yeah, it, it's, it's all about how our ears pick up the differences. And, and where those locations are, you know, where that symbol came from. The, well, the drums were recorded over there, you know, the cars, guitars over there, the courses back there, the foot pedals here. It's just how we measure those cues, and it goes back to head response transfer functions. Yeah, because I've always, you know, I've always wondered, well, I've always said, you know, at, at the at the three to $400 point, I always tell people, and maybe this is not the right thing to say, but I always say, you know, Get a low output, get a moving coil or a low output moving iron, because I feel like it is the next level. So, you know, paying, a, you know, a, buying an expensive moving magnet cartridge to me just doesn't make sense. But that that's just my opinion, because I do think there is something different in the low output um, that does it. It just it I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it does have more of a spatial. Yeah airy sound to it that's what you're just hearing it's the microdynamics it's the micro information they're very very important you don't want to lose that uh it's the that detail uh that allows us to different to create recreate that's our ears to hear that recreated space to make it those focus like and yeah. all recordings have those cues uh and um uh it's very important to try to preserve that as best possible one more question, sure. man, and then and then and then we'll let you go. Uh, no worries, John. I, I I really, man, I can't thank you enough. I, oh, you're very welcome. I, I don't care. If, I, even if we don't get any views on this, and I I had a great time talking with thank you. you. Um, I I mean, I really appreciate you taking your time out because I I do know how busy you are, and um, um. One last question: Does does a mono cartridge really make that big of a difference as opposed to, you know, running a stereo cartridge on a mono record? Do you really, do you think that's worth having the extra head shell? And I mean, I, I know that it tracks different because there's no left and right information. Yeah, it's, it's just the vertical up and down. Information. Yeah. Um, I can only speak from my experience um, with my mono LPs. I don't bother with a, uh, a mono a cartridge. Um, I think it picks up the information just fine. Um, some people swear by it. Um, you know, um, again, I, I think it's more important that why people, well, I think the reason why people say you have to have a, a, a mono cartridge to play, you know, a, a mono recording and things like that, and it sounds better. I sort of question from the standpoint that maybe the mono records, the production back then were better than the production in terms of recording mm-hmm. they are today. So maybe that's why mono records might sound better. You know, 
there was not a lot of layering, a lot of this, a lot of production like that. You know, if anybody's been in a modern recording studio, uh, everybody knows that Pro Tools, which they use to make recordings, you know, even the artists say, boy, that stuff sounds sucky. You know, it doesn't sound good. But, you know, 90% of all albums yeah. are made with Pro Tools, you know, Avid Pro Tools. You know, sure. It's just workflow Maybe production. 99. Yeah, so from that standpoint... You know, when they say this out, mono LP sounds great, well, maybe they were using a Neumann, you know, microphone going into an Ampex, and they, they you know, the other thing is more musical, because remember, they had to do it all in one take. You know, so yeah. the artist knew this, I got to make this yeah. make this really good. Nowadays, this is like, we'll splice this on that, we'll, we'll cut this onto this, and it's just like, it's all, it's, it's a Frankenstein, you know. You know, yeah. you know, when they put these things together, oh, that track didn't sound good. Can we pull that out? Or can we can live that level up? So from that standpoint, maybe we have hurt ourselves in terms of the recording arts by all this fancy schmancy, you know, stuff and stuff. And then, you know, Aphex vocal recorders. And, you know, <laughs> we were in lots of studios. You know, uh, I used to hang out at a power station when I was young and I saw all the stuff that they did. It's a lot of a lot of stuff that they do that you have no idea uh, in terms of what they wanted, yeah. um, in, in terms of that end product and how they got there and the, the kind of sound that they wanted. So when I, I hear people, well, this sounds better, that sounds this, you know, I say, hey, guys, let's take a step back. We had no idea what that sounded like to begin with. So you're saying that speaker sounds sure. better than that speaker on that recording? Uh, I, if that's what you like, more power to you. But let's not say in ultimate terms that one's better than the other because we don't know. We were not there. And, you know, how many people are there when they recorded that and produced it in the final end? You know, we have a lot of people who use our headphones sure. uh, in the pre-production, post-production. Um, even if they went during covid you know, um, we have friends in Nashville that they would buy, you know, four or five um, uh, RS1s and they were sent to the artists because what they would do is that the artist in his home studio would do this track and then this guy would do this track and then the final producer would get all the tracks together and then he would mix it all together and then he would say, send that out to all the artists, say how that sounds. They were all listening to it on great headphones because it was a unified experience. It was a it was a fixed point. Oh, this is sure. that we are listening to the same thing. Okay, this is what I mixed it down on, yep. so you know exactly yep. what I'm hearing and you're hearing. So it's all standardized. So they do that quite a bit. So yep. from that standpoint, you know, again, going back to the whole mono issue, you know, maybe those recordings were just great. That's why they sound so good. So whether you're using a stereo cartridge or a mono cartridge, knock yourself out. You know, um, it's a single is the single. You don't think you're you're gaining or you're not hurting your stereo? No, not at all. Stylus by all. tracking in a mono cartridge or anything like that. You're, you're fine. No, you know, our mono cartridges use an elliptical stylus. It's for mono, a modern, mo, <laughs> modern mono LPs. You know? Sure, sure, um, sure. So from that standpoint, a 78 is a whole different thing. Yeah, uh, and yeah, just yeah. for for the record, we're out of that business now. We're no longer making seventy eight because it's you. just yeah. it's just yeah. you know it's too hard. We can't get the diamonds any longer. We don't want to polish diamonds any longer for you know a point three conical. You know, if you find it, get it quick. You know, because we're out of that. Um, you know, I, you know, I think the you know, question was mainly for people that are buying like the new Rolling Stones box set. You know, in mono and they not you know get they it. just they, yeah yeah they, I. I don't if, if you got the extra money, maybe grab one and see see what all the fuss is about. But if, in my opinion, if you're going to buy a mono cartridge, you know, get a use use one speaker and go mono all the way. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean that that's the whole point of mono, in my opinion. It's one. It's from the Greek word one, yeah. meaning yeah. We have two ears. We hear in stereo, but um, we, yeah, we hear whatever. we hear a whole field and it, it goes back to the head response transfer functions and you need two speakers to do that and yeah so from that standpoint we do get the cues even though there's crosstalk which 
breaks up the head response transfer functions. Uh, I think it's um, mono records are there. Use them. Play them over stereo speakers. Enjoy it. You know, yeah. don't don't yeah. get, like you said. Don't get caught up in the weeds. You know, I love your yeah. your position. Let's not get caught up in the weeds. Let's get some nice equipment. You know, uh, vintage equipment is as good as stuff that's made today, uh, and yeah. um, it, it's a lot more fun. You know, sometimes looking well, at those blue lights, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, they'll seduce you. Well, yeah. I we we appreciate it, and really, you know. The vintage world, the audio world, the vinyl world wouldn't be around without Grado. I mean, your company really is, you know, keeping this alive. It's allowing us to, you know, take these old turntables that have been collecting dust forever in grandma's attic and, you know, bring back life into them. So, you know, for that and, um, you know, everybody watching, we thank you very much. Um, thank you for being there for, for, support for, oh. for supporting your customers. You know, I tell your customers, yeah. bring your turntables to Kevin. Let them clean it up. You know, get them all cleaned yeah. up. Those bearings are dirty. It's been sitting around for for a while, uh, and then uh, let him tune it up. It's like you got to put fresh oil in that car that's spinning in the garage for you ten do. years. You so. do, yeah. They're <laughs> worth it. It's worth it. The amount of enjoyment you're going to get out of it is nothing better than hearing somebody come back in after a Priceless. couple months and say, you know, we don't we don't really watch TV all that much anymore. You know, it seems nothing like we're all sitting around. <laughs> yeah, you know, there isn't. You're yeah. absolutely right, but. It is great to know that people are shutting that the box off. So. Yeah, absolutely. John, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Kevin, thank you. for inviting I mean, me. Really. Appreciate uh, it. it. Enjoy it. Another absolutely. time, hopefully down the road, sure. we can catch up again. And if I'm in New York, I'm going to come bug you. Okay. Um, I want to, I'd love to just see, just see, um, you know, see New York anyway. So there you go. Very good. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. You have yourself a great day. You have a great day and a great year. Happy Chinese New Year, which you was too. this weekend. And uh, peace awesome. and prosperity. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you John. Take care. Appreciate Cheers. it. Cheers. Bye. Bye.